Hello. This is going to be a discussion with exhibits and pictures of the McKittrick family history going back to the time of the Revolutionary War. Most of the material that we have was collected by my grandparents, primarily my grandmother McKittrick. Grandma McKittrick knew that she came from some very, very interesting pioneers. And she kept records and handed them down to me and hoped that I would do something with them. We've even found where she had done the preparatory work to get into the Daughters of the American Revolution, but she just couldn't quite get all the paperwork done that it took to do it by herself, and I don't think she got much help from her family. Now, this isn't going to be uh, just about a bunch of old people and dates, okay? This is really a very, very exciting story because this is about people that left England and Ireland, Northern Ireland, and in some cases Germany, and came over to the United States, and in our case here, found their way to Illinois, which was absolutely vacant territory, and created a life for themselves and a farm. Now, this book shows you a slight picture of the United States at the early part of the 19th century. And these people arrived in either New York or Philadelphia, and they made their way to Illinois. In some cases, they fought in the Revolutionary War on the East Coast before they got to Illinois. And to get to Illinois in those days, there were three or four ways across the country. And it was all on foot or horseback or in a wagon driven by oxen. And in the case of our Montgomery relatives that we're going to talk about, they came through by way of the Cumberland Gap between Tennessee, Virginia, into Kentucky and made their way up uh, to the Kentucky area and then eventually moved on to the Mississippi River in Madison County, Illinois. I have here in front of me an atlas. It's a different kind of an atlas. This is an atlas of about 1813. And it's, it's, a, it's all about geography, but it doesn't have maps in it, but it's all about geography. And in it, they describe, in early 1800, they describe Illinois Territory because it was not even a state yet. And they comment that it had only three towns, Kaskaskia, Goshen, and Cahokia. And Goshen is near where our relatives settled. And then it goes on to say, Illinois Territory is a part of what was formerly called the Northwestern Territory. It is like Michigan. Notice this. It is like Michigan, mostly in possession of the Indians, and is an extensive, fertile country, agreeably variegated with hills and meadows and covered by large rivers. That was the description of the country that these people moved into. We'll talk about four people primarily. And we have a great deal, as you can see, of backup material. But this is an overview to set in your mind the fantastic story of these people. And then we have backup material and individuals that you can read later. Thomas Montgomery is the first one to talk about. And he came to Kentucky and then Illinois from Northern Ireland. George Kinder, we think, came from Germany. 
though we haven't proved it yet, we're still working on it, we're pretty sure he was German. Samuel McKittrick came also from Northern Ireland. And another gentleman, Joseph Bartlett, who we don't hear his name a lot, but one of his children married in the McKittrick family. And that's why I included him. And also Bartlett was interesting among the four people I'm talking about because the records on him say that he had a library in his home and that he was an avid reader. And so I give him very high marks just for that. To get us started, I want to read a note in my grandmother's handwriting, Grandmother McKittrick, that would be again my father's mother, about her great-grandfather. She got her information from her great-grandfather's daughter. And so this is, this time in 2019, that's as close to the source as you can get. And she says this, her paternal great-grandparents were George W. and Isabel Kinder, who were pioneer settlers in Madison County. Mr. Kinder first came here from Louisville, Kentucky in 1811, making the trip alone on horseback through the country. Now, you have an atlas and you can take a look at the map and you can see where Louisville is and you can see where Madison County, Illinois is, Edwardsville, right near St. Louis. And they, that's the trip he made on horseback. After prospecting around, that means he's looking for land, finally purchased land between what is now Troy and Edwardsville, Illinois. He returned to Kentucky in 1812. And in the spring of 1813, he returned to Madison County with his wife and two children. The trip was again made, now notice this, the trip was again made on horseback, the horses carrying the bedding and the provisions. They drove a herd of cattle before them. Mr. and Mrs. Kinder walked a great deal part of the way carrying their two children, Jacob and Jane. Now, that tells you something about the relative. I have a map here of Madison County, and this shows Madison County. Here's the Mississippi River right on this side, and it's just across the river from St. Louis. And this area right in here is where the Kinders and the Montgomerys and McKittrick settled, and this area in here is where the German and Swiss relatives who came 50 years later settled. And you'll notice the way they did it, that every county is broken down into townships. And so we not only know where in the county they settled, but we have actually a map of the township and shows the plots of land where these people lived, Montgomery's, Kinder's, McKittrick's, they were, as, as they intermarried over the years, you can see exactly where their farms were. And in many cases, in certain many cases, we actually have the deeds and the land, uh, property titles of their land. For years, when I was a young man, there hung in our house, this deed of land from 1832, 1839, 1839. And when I was a little boy, they used to say that was an important document because Martin Van Buren, the president, now he was the president after Andrew Jackson, that Martin Van Buren had signed it. Well, you know, presidents don't sign deeds. Someone signs it for them. The significant thing, and we have the original of this, the significant thing isn't who signed it, but the fact that these people who came in found a way to buy the land, 
develop the land and add to the land over a period of time. But before we talk about some of those people, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like to settle down for those people in 18, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 before Illinois was a state. First of all, except for a little bit of Indian corn, the land had never been cultivated. A lot of it was prairie land, which meant there weren't a lot of trees, but there were prairie grass with deep, tough roots. In other places, there was forest, so you had to trim the wood, cut the wood, take out the stumps before you had land. And the first year you lived, you just planted around the trees and the shrubs until you could clear things off so you get a little food. In those early years, they were raising crops in order to live for subsistence, for them to eat. As the years went on, they would grow crops and sell them uh, for profit. When they settled down on a farm, at first they had nothing more than a lean-to and a fire out in the open. And eventually they would get a cabin built, and inside the cabin would be a stone fireplace. And they would do their cooking in the stove fireplace. Then, as things progressed into the 1830s and 40s, great inventions took place, such as the wood-burning stove. And this wood-burning stove, and we have a close-up for you to take a look at, is absolutely one of the major inventions of those times. The children's duty was to bring the firewood in so that the mother, who did all the cooking, had heat in the stove. But they didn't just bring in firewood. If she was perhaps baking that day, she would tell them the kind of wood she wanted. Maybe she wanted a harder wood for a bigger burn, a longer burn. And the kids had to know the wood. And they kept it going. And there they would build a fire in the bottom. And there they would cook on the top. And they could move to the right of the stove. The hottest was right in front on the left. And then if they wanted to cool or let simmer, they moved to the right. And they controlled it with all kinds of vents. It was a very, very great thing to cook on. My grandmother, Mater, who was my mother's mother, had one of these as well as a gas stove, uh, had one of these uh, when I was a little boy. And eventually she got rid of it. But she would use it on alternate days. So here we've, we've learned something on, about how they cook. It's also one of the exhibits we have here is a terrific book that my Aunt Eunice, who was my mother's sister, gave me. It's called Cooking Plain by Helen Linsenmeyer. And she has recipes of the early 1800s in Illinois and what they cooked and how they cooked it. And she even has uh, how they tested. For instance, there was no temperature in those days. And so they would put their hand in the oven to see. And in, if in 12 seconds, they could keep it in 12 seconds, it was 450 degrees. But if they could keep it in 30 seconds, it was 300, a little slow. That's how they did it. But this is wonderful. And some of these recipes are also great. But these are things that they, built, they cooked uh, in, in the early days. Some of the, uh, the family had fought, as we said, in the Revolutionary War. Um, uh, Montgomery was reputed to have been at Yorktown uh, when Cornwallis surrendered. Um, also, 
Montgomery was reputed to have fought with General Greene in the South. Uh, and that's probably right. They came in and they tend to move south and then through over to Kentucky. And so we have records and we're going to try to get more. But we know that we had enough relatives in the American Revolution that I have been accepted as a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. And that means that if I am, that any man or woman, son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, after me is also eligible if they wish to apply. In addition to the Revolutionary War, uh, these people fought in the War of 1812. That was the second war with England. Uh, and then after that, there was a Black Hawk War, where the Black Hawk Indians came across the Mississippi back into the Illinois country. And there was a short war there. You may remember Abraham Lincoln also fought as a soldier in that war. There was also a very, very interesting piece here in the material that my grandmother kept. And this one, of all her material, this one says, do not destroy. Twice it says, do not destroy. And what this is, is a page from the St. Louis Republic of 1889. But what it is, it's talking about the famous Wood River Massacre of 1814. So that was just about the time George Kinder was settling down on his land. And the Wood River Massacre took place, and you can Google it, took place on a Sunday. And the men were away and a group of women and their children was slaughtered. And this made a big impression on anyone living there. They were frightened for, for many, many years. But one of our relatives, uh, Montgomery, uh, Samuel Montgomery, and his, and rather, and his son, William Montgomery, William Montgomery was in the posse that they put together who went out and tried to find the perpetrators of the massacre and um, bring them to justice. I have in front of me here a record of ancestry. And you can't see a great deal uh, on the video, but this is the key to everything because it has names and dates. and. Uh, as you want to think about it, you know, this first column over here uh, of the pioneers, George Kinder, William Montgomery, Samuel McKittrick, Joseph Bartlett, was about the same time that Lewis and Clark were doing their great investigation of the West and Northwest for Thomas Jefferson. So that kind of puts it in perspective historically. Uh, you can also kind of do it, you know, this was the outdoor toilet crowd. Outdoor, didn't get indoor toilets to way over here. And you're gonna have a still that we've inserted in here of an outhouse. And I, I clearly remember uh, later on, uh, back in the 1930s, when I was a little boy, that one of my German relatives at the other end of Madison County had had a good year farming and he had to make the decision whether to buy a new tractor or put a toilet in the house in place of the outhouse and he chose the new tractor instead. It tells you something about those. But this is a very valuable uh, uh, sheet of paper We've talked about now Isabel Kinder, and she was, her mother and father had crossed the country. We gave you that story. She married Nelson Montgomery, and this was their home. They ended up with one of the more beautiful homes in Madison County. And this is from a 150-year-old booklet. 
But Linda and I have actually found the home and have walked around and taken pictures of it. And we also have a home from one of the descendants, immediate descendants of Jacob Kinder, and we've actually visited it, photographed it, and gone inside. So Nelson and Isabella Montgomery, and he would have been my great-great-grandfather, he built up a large farm, was a great horseman, was a great breeder, and uh, we have here uh, great detail on his 50th wedding anniversary. And it goes into who was there, and it goes into what was served and what have you. And very interestingly, two single people there was Charles McKittrick, who was my grandfather, and Cora Montgomery, who was my grandmother, who he who were at the wedding as single people. And whether they talked to each other or not, I don't know. But it shows in here on the listing. <clears throat> Nelson died in 1895. He was out checking his land and, and fell from his horse. He may have had a stroke. His wife lived some years later, ran the farm for a while. But we have complete record of everything Nelson owned on the farm. That's how they did it in those days. They made a list of all the items at probate. Every plow, the buckets, you know, all the tools. And whereas his father and, and father-in-law had started out with a one-horse plow, he had at least 12, 15 plows some of which were three horse plows. Very interesting material, information on him to read. When she was getting near the end, she rode her horse from their home, we talked about, near Troy, rode it over to Oaklawn Cemetery, where all the McKittricks and the Montgomerys were buried, and the kinders were buried, all buried in the same place, private cemetery. Linda and I have driven that exact route, and in the car it's about six minutes. It would probably have been 20, 30 minutes on horseback. And she rode over, and her husband had one of the largest monuments in Madison County, a gigantic uh, uh, gravestone, as we call it. And she went over and she planted peonies around the tombstone. And she said to someone with her, okay, now I've planted peonies. Nobody's going to have to bring me flowers when I'm dead. And she got on the horse and rode back home. And I've looked around the tombstone. I didn't see any peonies, but then she was buried at the same place. So we have details of that, details of the write-ups when they passed away and, and what have you. Now, there's a, so much material that I don't want to overdo it, but I do want to talk about my father for a moment. So... My, my grandmother McKittrick, my father's mother, her father was Nelson Montgomery's son. And he died at a very young age. But he was the first of any of these people among the pioneers to go to college. And he went to the University of Chicago for a few years. But he didn't graduate. And he died young. And the only thing we have is his algebra book from University of Chicago, including some writings in the margin and some notes and some fooling around that he did. I think he even has a poem in here uh, that he put. <clears throat> 
And um, it was a sad life for my grandmother because here she, she had the brightest, perhaps brightest son of the Montgomery family who died early. Her mother was a disagreeable person who told her how ugly she was. She eventually married Charles McKittrick, who was my grandfather. But she kept all these things about the family. And Grandma had my father, my Uncle Jim, my Uncle Wade, and Aunt Isabel. And then she lost two children. She had four children. And my father was a very interesting person. And I just want to tell you a few things about him. He only went to the eighth grade. After the eighth grade, he quit school and he took a civil service exam to be a mailman. And he got to be a mailman in 1916 and 17. And this is his grade sheet here. And what's interesting is he was competing with several people for the mailman job. And it was a rural mailman, rural. This, here's my father with his horse and buggy, okay? That's his horse and buggy. And this on spelling, he did 65 out of 100. Arithmetic, 99 out of 100. Letter writing, 68 out of 100. Penmanship, 75. And then copying from plain paper, 100. Reading addresses, 100. So he came out with a scale of 84 and almost uh, 85. But one of the people competing against him was his eighth grade teacher. And he got a higher grade than his eighth grade teacher. Got the job for $1,200 a year as mailman. His rote was over in Highland, Illinois, where my mother lived. And he actually stabled his horse and had a room in a rooming house one block from the young lady that he would eventually marry. We have other interesting pictures um, of him that uh, we're going to be showing to you through, st uh, through um, stills. But we have a picture of when he was a young kid working in Diamling Brothers Butcher Shop. He was a runner for them. He also learned how to, to, uh, to kill calves and animals. And he would describe his great glee, uh, how you would hold the calf down, you'd slit its throat, you'd save the blood, and then you'd carve it up and, and sell it in the butcher shop. And uh, they also tell a story about his, his father, it was both a farmer and, a, and he had a, a uh, what's called a livery stable. A livery stable is something like a Hertz car rental, but people would come to town, they'd need to rent a car, excuse me, no cars, but rent a horse and buggy, or they had a horse and buggy at their home, no room for it, they would stable it at the livery stable. And there'd be some salesman from St. Louis who rented his horse and buggy for a few days, then he'd have to go back to the train. And my father would take him back in the wagon and maybe fall asleep on the way back, but the horse knew how to get home, so the horse would come traipsing back and there'd be my father asleep at the switch. Before, <clears throat> before I leave the... Montgomery's and the McKittrick's over near Troy, Illinois. There are a couple of other artifacts I just want to point out to you. First of all, you, I just mentioned the livery stable. We actually have two horse brushes uh, from the livery stable that they used for brushing down the horses. And my father saved these all those years. So that came from that. Very interesting. And the, my mother 
and grand, my grandmother and grandfather McKittrick never had very much money at all. But they always lived with dignity. Uh, uh, they, uh, for instance, this happens to be a, it could have been a coffee pot at one time, we don't know. But this was a little pot that they kept molasses in. And the McKittricks were very big on using molasses on pumpkin pie and on pancakes and waffles. And this is the, 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 the uh, canister they used for holding it. They also had a tea and coffee set. It wasn't sterling like all the folks nowadays have. It was silver plate. But, you know, they were proud, and in those days, you know, people came to visit, they were served tea, and I, we have that, it's still intact, and uh, I have it. And this, we mentioned earlier about <clears throat> William Montgomery, my great-grandfather, who went to University of Chicago but died very young. This was his wine cup. You notice both these are very beautifully polished and shined. And this is all due to Cecilia Calderon. You all know Cecilia, and Cecilia is keeping all this stuff in very good shape. There's one other item I'd like to point out, and this is a series of arrowheads. And these aren't just arrowheads, but Grandpa McKittrick had a farm, and Linda and I have been and seen where the farm was. It's right now next to a massive intersection outside Troy, Illinois. But when he was a little kid, he dug up these while plowing. As the ground turned over, Indian arrowheads would surface. And Jack McKittrick, my brother, has half of them. And I have these. And I'm very, very proud of them because they weren't bought from a, some Indian collector. They were from the parents' farm. Now, we've <clears throat> spent a lot of time talking about the McKittrick Kinders and Montgomery's. And if you recall the map here, they were located over here in this part of Madison County. And down here in this corner right here, almost out of the county, is where our German and Swiss relatives lived. I want to talk about them now. Michael Motter was a farmer in the United States, but he came from Baden, Germany. And we have detailed paperwork on him in Germany. He was a border guard. And he got permission to leave and come to the United States. And they evaluated him and said that he was a very calm, trustworthy border guard. And he came over in the 18, late 1850s, and he settled in a Swiss community, Highland, Illinois, which is down in that corner I just showed you. And <clears throat> he had a son, Michael, and Michael would be my grandfather. And I can remember that whenever we were together with any of my grandfather's family, they all spoke German. Now, my grandfather spoke perfect English, but he could also speak German. And in those days, whenever families didn't want you to know what the adults were talking about, they would just switch to German. But your grandfather Mater, uh didn't like farming, and he headed into the city, became a stockroom clerk in a grocery store, and eventually became a managing partner of a very large grocery store. Very interesting guy. And we have complete obits on him. That was the modern side of our family. Now next, we'll discuss the Meyer and the Grossenbacher families. Anna Meyer came over to the United States about 1870. She came from near Zurich, Switzerland. 
She was a widow with four little girls. One of those little girls was Louisa Meyer, who would become my great-grandmother. We have the trunk that contained their belongings when they moved. It was made specifically for them. Imagine four young girls and their widowed mother with very little English moving from Switzerland to Illinois in 1870 and all their belongings were in this trunk. And Anna Meyer was a widow who brought these four. We're still doing research on this, but it appears that she was part of a very big family. And uh, the Landolts, L-A-N-D-O-L-T-S. And we think that she came over with other Landolts so she wouldn't be alone. But we don't have any record that she was ever remarried. We do have a record of, of her, her, her death. But when Linda and I were doing all these, this work in Highland, we observed in the Highland Cemetery, which is different than the Oak Lawn Cemetery we talked about earlier. In the Highland Cemetery, there didn't seem to be a gravestone for Anna Meyer. And so my brother Jack and I donated a gravestone. We had a nice stone made up, and I want to read you the words on it. It says, Anna Meyer, and then her maiden name, Landolt, Zurich, 1825, Highland, 1895, a widow who brought four young daughters to Highland circa 1870 in honor of her courage, determination, and pioneering spirit. We thought that she deserved better than not having a tombstone. And so that is in the family plot with the other Grossenbachers. Her daughter, she had a daughter, and her daughter married Daniel Grossenbacher. And their child was my grandmother. There are plenty of charts you can look at to get it straightened out. But Grossenbacher's father, Jacob, who was the one that immigrated first, uh, he came over and he opened a corn grist mill. And we have a picture of it. And a corn grist mill where he would grind the corn. So the farmers raised corn. They'd, they would use some corn for feed, some corn. They'd come in and grind up. They would sell, make um, uh, corn meal for cooking. Uh, they would get some byproduct that they fed to the animals. And so he had a business doing that. But he was also a very enterprising gentleman, was Jacob, Jacob uh, Grossenbacher. He was one of the first, when Highland got organized and had a city government, he was one of the first aldermen, city councilman, alderman. And he had the east end of town. And he also did something very interesting. He was one of the first investors in the Pet Milk Company. Pet Milk was a company that started in Highland, Illinois and then spread around the world, but it started there. And he was a part of a group of four or five men that put up cash at the very beginning to get it started. He died before it became a successful company, so he never got rich off of it. So we've got then the Myers came over. One of them married a Grossenbacher. And, and then we have as a result of that marriage, my grandmother. And that trunk is an interesting thing. Sitting on the trunk, I always have a picture of Grandma Grossenbacher. She was my grandmother's mother. And she was a fierce looking woman. And when I used to stay at my grandmother's house, I was up in a bedroom upstairs all by myself because they had moved downstairs. And her picture would be on the bureau, and it scared me at night. So I would take the picture, and I would hide it in the drawer. And my mother would make, my grandmother would make the bed the next day, and she would take the picture out again. And she never said anything to me about it. I feel so bad about it, 
that I now keep her picture on the trunk. <laughs> okay, in part payment for my insensitivity uh, earlier. As we said earlier, my grandfather, Mike Motter, moved into town and started in with a man named Bardill in the store business. And they eventually built up a very, very interesting uh, store, uh, the Highland Cash Store, uh, which covered about uh, four buildings. And they had live chickens. They had a bakery. I always remember meeting the baker because he went to work at three in the morning. And then Mr. Duncan in the chicken department. I always remember Mr. Duncan, but Mr. Duncan didn't bathe very often. And uh, you could tell when you were with Mr. Duncan. But he had all these chickens. And at one point, they used to ship chickens, carloads of chickens to the East Coast. And this was before refrigeration. And so they had special cars where each chicken had its little spot and there's a picture of it here in the still that you can look at that shows them loading the chickens and there's in front of it is a Highland store buggy and then you'll notice on top of the car are all these kids sitting it looks as though the young kids in Hollywood in, in Highland we're all kind of sitting on top, watching them load the car, and you can see the different compartments with the chickens in it. But then the Highland store had a grocery department, and then it had ladies and men's ready to wear. It had millinery, hardware, and uh, it was a big, very general store for this little town of Swiss and German people. And I can remember my grandfather, there's sort of a raised place uh, in part of the store with a kind of a little railing around it and he had his desk in there and he would be checking things and what have you uh, back and forth. My mother uh, worked in the store and uh, did bookkeeping and I can remember that on certain days he would go into St. Louis to buy merchandise for the store. And he'd always get up very early and take the bus, go into town, and come back late that evening. And as I recall, it was always a different day uh, because of throwing off schedule. And there was always something different about that particular day. But the record of the very interesting things this store did, their advertisements, uh, and, and the thing, we have a picture here of the store, and... There are several different pictures, but this one here shows a whole group of immigrants that are arriving. Evidently, the, the train into Highland had let them off, and they came to the store, whether they came there to get goods, or to buy clothes, or to, or, or, or to transport to be, uh, to be processed, or I have no idea, but they're in front of the store. But if you look up, there was a second story and a little peaked roof. And on, in that room up there, that apartment up there, where my mother was born on the 21st of December, uh, 1900. So we've got these interesting aspects and we have pictures backing them up. But I wanted to point out the fact that uh, a lot of, again, and emphasize that we have a lot of this material because Grandma Mater and Grandma McKittrick kept. This happens to be a, an atlas of Madison County. And this has all the fam big families, farm families written up, the history and those plots of land that I showed you earlier. And then we have three or four of these various Madison County history books, which you know, how these things do, you give money so they can publish the book, and in turn, what they do is give you a really nice write-up uh, in the book. My grandfather, Mater, had three daughters. And here you see the family picture, and you can see my mother, and Eunice is on the left, my mother on the right, 
and Aunt Wilma, her younger sister, down below. And he always said that he didn't want any old maids in the family. But it was very interesting for the early 1920s, all three daughters went to college. And my mother uh, actually, uh, as a result, taught commerce in high school before she married my father, taught commerce. And during the war in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, when I was in high school and there was a teacher shortage, mother would come out and teach typing and bookkeeping in some of the high school classes, which I thought was very exciting as a substitute teacher. So we have a lot of material. What we need to do is to get some of this all written up in, in a nice bound booklet uh, with the pictures for a more permanent record. And I'm hoping over time we can get that done. Lynn and I have carried most of the load up to now. We'd like to have a volunteer, a little bit more help. Uh, we also need to know more about the families back in Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, and back in Switzerland. Uh, you know, religion played a very big part in those days. And Southern Ireland was very Catholic. Northern Ireland in those days was very Presbyterian. And our family came from Northern Ireland. And they also came from the Protestant part of Switzerland. And we need to do more reading up and finding out that there may be possible databases over there we can tap into. And we need to know also more about what happened in Kentucky, because we do know that, that um, George Kinder's father, Jacob Kinder, was killed by the Indians, but we don't know. And there were a series of wars around Boonesboro, Kentucky, and we need to find out more about that. <clears throat> so I'm going to stop at this point because information on the rest of the family <clears throat> that are more current we can talk about. But there's one very couple significant points that I want to make. <clears throat> First of all, these people were pioneers. The early ones were pioneers in farming. The second came into a strange land without a different language, and they went into business and established their families and were very happy citizens. But as the years went on, the farming part of the family, the McKittricks and the Montgomerys, through large families, dividing the land among the children, farm depressions, economic troubles, what have you, things did not go well in the early 1910, 20 period for the farming group over in Troy and Edwardsville. It was very interesting that my grandfather McKittrick, his wife, my father, my uncle Jim, uncle Wade, Aunt Isabel and her husband, Clarence, they all picked up, and in the 1920s, moved to Detroit, Michigan, where, in other words, they left the declining agricultural economy in Illinois. They went to where Henry Ford and the others were building a dynamic new high technology industry, the automobile industry. And my father, remember, with only an eighth grade education, he studied bookkeeping, studied accounting, and he went into the office. And some of them went into the factory. And the ones that went into the factory uh, became what we would now call blue collar workers and almost none of their children went to college, whereas those of us that were in the office, he became an executive, 
And at that point in time, you know, I was the first of the family to graduate from college after my mother. My mother was the first, really. I was the second. So I think there's a family history here that we can be proud of. There was a lot of hard work. There was not only pioneering, but just a lot of hard work. Uh, there was a lot of bouncing back. And later on, when my father, and we can talk about that separately again, but my father was in the automobile business, and he worked his way up, and he and another man ran a factory down in Memphis, Tennessee, and it made car bodies. It was called Murray Body Company. And this man ran the factory, and my father handled the bookkeeping, the accounts receivable, uh, the administrative work, paying the bills, things like that. He hired IBM machines, rented IBM machines from a company that had hardly ever been heard of in the 1920s. He hired these IBM machines to do assist in the accounting work. And when the Depression got really bad in the automobile industry and his plant started going downhill, he threw the IBM machines out because they were rented in those days. You couldn't buy them. And then the plant closed and he was out of a job. He had two small children, my brother and I. We were both under three, wife, no job. And the IBM salesman, whose name was Frank Hussman, came to him and he said, Mac, why don't you come to work as an IBM salesman? We're hiring people. And he said, I don't know anything about selling. I've never sold anything in my life. He said, no, but we sell machines that do work for people. And you understand the work, the payroll, sales analysis, accounts receivable, accounts payable. And so my father went to work at the height of the Depression as a salesman for IBM. And it was quite fortuitous for all of the family. Thank you.